my great pleasure to be here. I think it's a wonderful setup. It's a beautiful room you're having here. And uh, as has been said, I've been working closely to one of the very first space missions, Swiss-led Swiss missions uh, with other European countries amongst this country to um, look for planets. And uh, I will be talking about something a bit broader, uh, which I do call the exoplanet revolution. I try to convince you we are really in a living an extraordinary moment right now in humankind, um, doing things that you would have been impossible to dream about um, 30 years ago. And, and that's the purpose of this lecture. Um, and, um, and I will show you um, how something that started 30 years ago um, is leading to something even more profound, which is the very deep concept of life in the universe. Um, OK, to start with, um, I'd like to summarize 3,000 years of discoveries uh, is in this diagram. The solar system has been the topic of research, and it was the most complicated topic for any mathematicians until the 17th, 18th centuries to solve. Which, how does it work? Um, it's quite fascinating that the picture we had uh, 3,000 years ago uh, by just the naked eyes and the planet we could see that gave rise to the seven days of the week and all that kind of mythology um, is now turning up in an extremely complex system. So this is as it is today, the understanding that we have of the solar system. So the reason why I show you that is I do think that you now exploring other stars far away and exploring the planet and other star is really the very beginning of the story I do want to go back 3,000 years ago, but, but we're not at that level here. But tomorrow we shall. And I want to give you a little bit of a clue why. So why do we matter? Why the fact that there are planets on other star matters? Well, it belongs to the grand scheme of the universe, how we are, we understand this. Well, if you think about the building block of the universe, when you have the Big Bang at the beginning, this is an extremely boring moment because you create only space, time, and matter. And matter, extremely simple. Essentially, only hydrogen that you have there. Nothing else. It's a very boring universe. But the magic of this is in the law of physics that are embedded into this very moment, you are leading to the star. And the star is the stellar component, is the unit that is making miracles. It's kind of a chemistry mechanism here that is producing all the element that is really being used in this room right now. And from this element that are being made into the star, well, there are some places around the star which is being formed according to this kind of global picture. When you form the star, you have something around the star, which is planets, which are planets. And on this planet, you're doing other kind of chemistry a bit cooler chemistry, and then you're building up a complex chemistry, and this chemistry is eventually leading to life, especially on our planet. So it's very interesting, these connections. So sometimes we time to divide the physics into the hardcore physics and life. Actually, everything is connected, because it's the same story we're talking about. We're just talking about the growth of complexity here. And the reason why we do care is we have one good example of our planetary system, which is our own planetary system, but how does it work? So that is exactly the purpose of astrophysics, trying to make sense to all this and trying to make sense of what is, I mean, how does it work and where are we living? Now, the idea of planet on another star is very old, and you find Greek mentioning the possibilities that stars could be like the sun. And you find possibilities that if stars are like the sun, it means there must be other planets also on other stars. The idea went and disappeared and came back. But the possibility of planet on other star is something looming around since a long time. It took an amazingly long time to find out and whether they are. And the reason why is because it's tremendously difficult to find a planet on other star. Well, there's two problems. The first one is stars are very far away. And if you imagine they're far, you can just multiply this. They're really, really far compared to what you can apprehend. And the other reason is planets are located near something extremely bright, which is a star. So essentially, to see it is almost impossible. So you have to guess. So the idea of detecting 
planet orbiting other stars uh, came about 100 years ago. And using simple mechanism, uh, one of them is just the fact when you have an orbiting planet orbiting a star, the star is moving. You see this by moving back and forth here. And if you use a principle which is called the Doppler Fizeau mechanism, which is related to the, to the wavelength, change of the color of the wavelength, or change of the sound, depending on the motions, then if you can directly measure the speed of the star using this mechanism, which is the Doppler effect, then you may be able to see a tiny motion. And this tiny motion will tell you there is a planet. And if you really are lucky, at the time the planet goes right in front of you, and at that very moment right now, um, the planet going across the disk of the star, you create what is called as a transit or an eclipse, if you are more familiar with this terminology. The problem of these techniques is when you look at the solar system, the biggest planet that we have in the solar system, the more likely one that to be detected looking at the star, is Jupiter. And Jupiter is by far away. It's about takes about more than 10 years to orbit the whole sun. The probability of Jupiter to be seen from another planet, from other alien civilizations to be transiting is extremely low, almost zero. And then the effect of Jupiter on the sun is very tiny. It's about the speed, the change of the speed of a running man, which is 1,000 times smaller than the typical speed you're facing in, uh, in the galaxies. So it's a technical problem. It's not a, a conceptual problem to detect that. It's just a technicality. How do you do that? And what we did 30 years ago is assemble for the first time a machine that would be able to do that. And I don't want to spend too much time on the technology, but I just want to tell you that if you're not familiar with science, how it works. How come the creativity, the innovation embed into the science and how much this is creating new innovations? This is a machine that detected the first ever planet on other stars 30 years ago. I spent my PhD on this machine, so I know every bit of this machine here. It's called LOD. Um, at the time it was set up, it was 93. So we're celebrating you now the 30th anniversary, actually, of LOD, which was, first light was in June, so it's not far from the 30 years anniversary. Why did we do something that nobody was able to do before? Well, because we use a lot of tricks and technology tricks. The first trick is this piece here. This is a, called a grating. It was the first of this kind at that time. It was a brand new technology. It's, and it allows you to get extremely high resolutions and a lot of colors and get you the very accuracy you need uh, to measure the speed of the star. The other trick we have been using, and you may see it, is this stuff here, which is yellow, orange. Sorry, it's orange. So this, at that time, was brand new. It's called optical fibers. You know all that today. So that was a trick then we didn't need to have this equipment on the bottom of the telescope. We could have it in the basement, very stabilized, and that would give us the stability we needed to achieve the extreme precision we needed there. But that's not enough, because to do the solving the problem, it's a big mathematical problem, actually, to solve. And at that time, the only machinery available were other, the kind of PC, very limited, only essentially used for bureautic and all the mainframe, and you need to usually a big space and very difficult to get access. But someone revolutionized the computer science at that time by making this. This is based on a unit that used to be on a very powerful computer at that time called the Cray computer. Some people left Cray, opened a company, created Microsoft, Microsun, Microsystem. That's called the mini computer. And that was a complete revolution because the scientists, I'm not the only one, a lot of science happened at that time thanks to this machine because that was superpower computing, professional computing in the lab. And with this, we were able to achieve something that nobody did, which is get a precision of 10 meters per second, which is about 30, 36 kilometers per hour, that was enough to detect the motion of Jupiter. At that time, we started the program. Now, the big surprise is we were not expected. I was not expected to find a planet because it takes years to see Jupiter. But the understanding we had on the planet and on the star was very, very flown, very limited. Now, I want to jump 30 years of discovery right now to give you a kind of a very short summary. If you have to remember something, what we have learned about planet and other stars. To do that, I have to show you a diagram, and actually two diagrams, 
when you have every dot you have on this diagram is a discovery. It's a real measurements, and the measurements are expressed in terms of three parameters. The mass of the planet, the radius of the planet, and the period, the orbiting period of the planet. So every dot is a discovery. The first planet that was discovered belonged to this category here, which was we call the hot Jupiter. It was the mass of Jupiter and about the orbit of four days. Completely impossible to imagine such a planet because there is not such a planet in the solar system. Jupiter is very far away. It's not very next to the stars. Well, that was the first one we picked up. And this is the magic of the game because the technology I've described to you that was not optimized to find planets like the lost system actually are really good to find this short period system. And we started to find quite a lot of them. It's fair to say that nobody believed to that. And as a young scientist, I had a couple of uh, rough time for three to four years uh, trying to explain that this is real. I mean, we're detecting planets that are different from the one we are in the solar system. Well, the more discovery came, uh, the more obvious the situation um, I mean, was for everybody. And gradually, the, the, um, our peers and uh, the science community got convinced about the reality of the system. And you see the reality is even more complicated than that these days. Because we're not only detecting what's called hot Jupiter, which is short period orbiting planet like Jupiter, and we have some of them with a mass, and that the one uh, here with the mass of Jupiter, this is solar Earth mass, and Jupiter is here to help you to read this diagram. Uh, we have transit of them. Um, we have also this uh, kind of populations of planet that looks about like Jupiter, but not exactly. Some of them are any orbit between, between Mercury and then, and then Jupiter. But the big surprise came with uh, this new kind of planet that nobody had expected that we used to call super Earth and mini Neptunes, which are rising here in this regime in terms of mass. So this is the mass of the Earth. It's about the mass of Neptune here, uh, going the same, the size of the Earth here, and the go to size of Neptune. And this is a big chunk of planet here we have in this regime, whether we detect the mass or whether we detect the size, um, that came as a complete surprise. Now, what should be striking for you on this diagram is essentially the planet like we know of, like Jupiter and Earth. We don't have that many. And there is a reason for that, it's because we are limited by the technology but to detect planet. Essentially, anything on the left on these lines that I draw here can be found by the current technology. Anything on the right side can't because it's below the sensitivity of what we can do. So the reason why we have not found yet a planet like the Earth or, or Venus, it's because we can't. Uh, it's more, way more difficult than we thought uh, to do that originally. Uh, but we don't really care because the universe has been very kind with us. It gave us a gift. There is a lot of planets which are different. And, and the news here is when you try to do the math and to ask the questions, what is the chance that you find any of these planets you are coming up with a strange number, which is the vast majority. This is the rate of each of the system or the occurrence of the system. So more than half of the stars and even 80% of the star that you have in the sky that are in a similar I mean, uh, evolution that, that the sun have a planet that belongs to this category. And these are very awkward planets because when you look at the period between 10 days here, 20 days, even 100 days, they would be almost fitting within the orbit of our own Mercury. So all these planets, they have no counterpart whatsoever with the solar system. So from this, we conclude that the solar system is awkward and its sense is unique according to that. It's very unlikely to be unique. It's just we fail detecting them. But we know already, according to this number, that it's not common. So we can tell you that solar system is not the archetype on what we expect in the universe. And in a sense, this is a continuation of the Copernican revolutions here. Because at that time, we set the Earth at the right location and telling, well, the Earth is just one of planet amongst many. And then we said later, oh, but the sun is amongst many stars around the galaxies. And all oh, the galaxies amongst many galaxies in the universe, and so on, and so on, and so on. Well, we're just telling everybody right now, well, look, the solar system is one of the many systems, but a lot of the systems are different from our own system. Now, when you combine these two 
data point, the mass and the size of the planet, you end up with a very interesting conclusion, which is this diagram which gives you the density of the planet or the structure of the planet. So again, this is real data. There is a bit of a bar, which is error bars, which is the margin of uncertainty we build up in the measurements. This is very difficult measurements to do. And, and you do see to help you a couple of reference here, like the Jupiter and Saturn, and I just added the modeling we have on the inside of this planet. So we know exactly where the density goes in this planet according to the mass of radius. You can move the mass on the size. You will have to be sitting in some uh, regime here, which is telling you the physics of the planet. So you see Jupiter and Saturn are laying on the same kind of uh, physical pattern. But you realize at the time you reach Neptune here, you recognize Neptune, you don't predict exactly the same structure. There's a good reason why, because Neptune has far less light gas, essentially hydrogen, than Jupiter and Saturn. It's seen as a failed giant planet. Most of the planet we have found, the big planet we have found, the, the, the Jupiter, hot Jupiter, there seems to be sitting above this line of the diagram. You see the little block here? Well, they're a bit more fluffy. They're a bit more lighter in terms of density. It's possibly because they're very hot. So it makes them a bit different, and there's kind of different pattern going on in the physics of these planets. But we do see have also some of them that really clearly there. Now, the big surprise is when you look at all this population of planet here, which is much denser, the blue, um, I mean, um, actual line or, or I mean, simulation here, it's a planet that doesn't really exist. It's a water planet. So you use water, and you try to make a planet. We, we use water because it's very well known. Water under high pressure is well understood, essentially because the people studying the in interior of the planet had to know this. It's a very critical element to know that. Um, Earth scientists did a lot of experiment. We have a lot of experimental development on, on the water, on the high pressure and high temperature. This is why you can make a planet, and kind of theoretical planet. And you see some of the planets seems to be kind of of that regime. Some of them could be what we call water world. And we have the green line, which is using the Earth as a reference, or anything that would be rocky, essentially rocky, without going into too much detail. And we do have rocky planet as well. So you do see that to summarize this diagram, um, and there's a lot of complicated element here, but just to make it simple, so amongst the diversity of the planet we have found, well, most of the planet seems to be much closer to the star than us. Um, and we have a quite substantial amount of planet that are rocky. So this is really the beginning of the fun, because when you start having rocky planet next to the star, you're asking the question, oh, how does it look like? Um, do they have water? Do they have oceans? Do they have continents? And what about life? And all this is, is extremely boosting the topic and, and adding more data. And, and the magic of that is we can not only detecting planet and give you some idea of the density of the systems, we can go for much further we can look at the atmosphere of this planet. We don't see the planet. It's very difficult, and we will in the future, but it needs 50 years of development and other space missions to do that. But we can still sense the atmosphere into the planet. How we do that is pretty simple. We're using the principle of the fact that most of this planet have been detected in transit. So it turns out that the orbit is a line along the sign, line of sight. So we do see what's called a transit at some moments. So the planet is going in front of the star, and there is a moment when the planet goes behind the star. And we have a series of wonderful equipment, some of them that are already flying. You know them, the James Webb Space Telescope, for example. And ESA has access to that. And every country, including this country, is connected to ESA. So there is really a program that is dealing with that. There is this amazing telescope called the ESO ELT telescope, extremely large telescopes, that will be doing this and is building up right now. And in the future, is a mission called Ariel. <coughs> so how do we do that? Well, when the planet goes in front, um, you get a sense that it's a bit like um, when you have the sun set on the sunrise, you get the feeling that the sun is changing color, right? You have the sun is being reddish and becomes bluish. It becomes, sorry, um, yellowish later. Um, well, the sun doesn't change color. Uh, the only reason why you have this change of color is because the light from the sun has to cross way more atmosphere, and actually some of the light can't cross. The blue, for example, that is why the sky is blue, because the blue is diffuse. It's called red scattering in the blue sky. But the red goes straight away and cross the atmosphere right away. So if you observe a transit, you observe essentially the shadow of the planet, 
It gives you access to the size of the planet. Well, depending on the color where you observe it, the blue or the red, you will see different layers of the atmosphere because the light will be crossing through the atmosphere or not. So it will reflect into a different size. So the planet doesn't have the same size depending the color you are observing the transit. And this is being used every day from space and from ground astronomy. And once you have the different color respond, then you can inverse the problem. It's called retrieval. And you can get a feeling what is the atmosphere of the planet. It's a bit like an X-ray uh, through the atmosphere of the planet. Now, the other moment is even more fascinating is when the planet goes behind. Why so? Well, let's just do an experiment. And let's imagine you have a telescope and you observe a, a planet orbiting a star with a transit. If you record the light from, with your telescope from that system, well, you would see something like that. So you will see the light. This is the amount of light here you have. And then you will see this big event, which is a transit. I was mentioning this is a time. And then there is a, this is a moment when the planet goes in front of the stars. This depth depends on the color as I said, and you can use that to get an idea of what is in the atmosphere of the planet. Now, this moment is fascinating because it is when the planet goes behind. It's a moment when you only see the stars, so that's this moment, the bottom is a zoom in, and essentially, because this is a moment when the planet is behind, the light you do see at that moment is only the light from the star, nothing else. So anything above that line is the planet. So actually, when you have a transiting system, you see a combination of the star and the planet. And you do see this kind of wiggling, which is the day side and the dark side of the planet. So it's darkish at that moment, because you see the, 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 um, the face of the planet not observing, not looking at the stars, it's looking at us. And that moment is when the planet is facing the star. So this pattern here, give you an idea of the structure of the upper atmosphere. It's a reflection or so the thermal emissions of the planet. This is how we find out the temperature of the atmosphere of a planet on the upper atmosphere. We find out the amount of cloud. We can even measure the speed of the rotation of the cloud on the upper layer on the planet. We can do that in many wavelengths. And this, and what I was mentioning in the transit, which is called transit spectroscopy, is what the James Webb Space Telescope is doing right now about 25% of the time is doing that. And he's doing that on the small planets. So I hope I convince you that we can not only detect planets, but we can also understand what they're made of, kind of the density, whether they are rocky or whether they are more like a water world or more, more like a giant planet. And we can even tell you what is going on on the atmosphere. OK, so now we have to make the next step. Can you tell us what's going on on the surface of the planet? Well, to go through that, I have to go back on something we know very well and to borrow a diagram for my dear colleague, Earth scientist. This is the story of the Earth. In a very synthetic way, as a clock, you start at the bottom here uh, when you make the planet. And the reason why I show you this picture is for you to understand that the planet we're living in is not a static object. It's an evolving object. It's something it's connected with the interior is connected with the outside. And the outside is connected with the whole universe in terms of what's coming on on the planet. At the very early phase, the planet was much hotter, has much more gas, had a lot of uh, outgazing elements, received a lot of impact from the outer part of the solar system that turned out to be a lot of ice CO2, essentially, so carbon is falling, is raining carbon at the early stage. So that's why when people are asking me whether there are enough carbon on the planet, I say there's plenty. There's no need to worry about that because so much is falling at the very beginning. And the planet is getting a structure. The very heavy elements are sinking in and making a core, maybe starting a magnetic field structure. And it's cooling down, and the atmosphere is reaching a kind of a static moment, stabilized moment, with CO2, which is that very moment, with part of the interior getting out to volcanic activity. And, and then there is a cycling mechanism, which is a CO2 cycling we know very well um, going on on Earth. Now, at some time, in the case of the Earth, about 
half a billion years after the formation step. So this is a clock, and you start the planet, you get about 100 million years, you create the moon 20 million years at the beginning, and then you end up with this. And at that moment, about half a billion years, you have something going on. And the chemistry of the planet on the surface likely is affecting the system and create life. And life for a long moment is very silent. You don't see it very well. And then at some moment create a massive event and completely change the atmosphere and, and transforming the atmosphere. Anything in the atmosphere we're breathing today is produced by life. Anything, even the carbon we're making is just processed by life. So we have a planet which is fully alive in a complete sense um, because it's, it's a fully evolving process. Now, what is fascinating as an astrophysicist here is this story. Well, this is a story you can test on other planets. How could you do that? Well, you can compare each of these phases I was describing, which unfortunately are gone in a sense that there is almost no record on Earth because the plate tectonic tend to recycling everything and we have not a single clue of the first billion years. We're only guessing what's going on. We can predict what the atmosphere of a planet looks like according to this model. And this is what I have here on the right side. I have these three different stages, arcane earth. Um, sorry, I just missed the, yeah. Arcane earth, uh, proterozoic earth is when you start life, and then right now. And you do see, and that's what I want to, just the message I want to tell you. This is the reflection, the albedo, and the other one is the atmospheric uh, re uh, reason for that. There is a huge effect it's not just a tiny detail. I'm not talking about a few percent here. It's huge. You completely change the picture you have. So it's not technically difficult to find out what's going on, whether you have a lot of uh, um, uh, methanes on the atmosphere or water or, or anything on the atmosphere. It's, it's just to make sure you build up the picture. But you can't do that. And we are going that way. We're not really detecting a planet exactly like the Earth, but we can definitely find out. So of course, when you start doing that, the next question is, well, can we find out that there is some life going on on the planet? And I think you open up a whole new territory here. And I want to share a little bit what is going on on this field very quickly, because it's just, just ongoing. It's a new development. But to do that, I want to open maybe a more global statement here and ask you two simple questions uh, related to the topic. Why life emerge on Earth? Why? Why that planet? Maybe similar effect, similar things happened on Mars in the past or on Venus in the past. Well, in some way, we will be find out this pretty quickly. And does it mean that it's full of life everywhere in the universe. Life in a, in a more global sense, in a sense you can start life and then stop life. Or you can have life and it doesn't evolve. So I'm not talking about something that would come much later in our case, which is consciousness, which is not something I'm dealing here. I'm just dealing with the foundation of life. And then I would like to quote, I think, someone who I think summarized um, famous Nobel Prize Christian de Duve um, very well the question. So in a sense, it's a bit, it's a bit amazing extraordinary to think about the universe in a global sense. Again, this very special moment when you create not very much, just, just time and space, maybe dark matter, we don't know what it is, and dark energy and hydrogen, maybe a lithium a little bit, and helium, and nothing else. But the law of physics were embedded at that time already, and all the rest would follow. Does it mean that life is also embedded, encrypted into the physics of the universe? Um, Possibly. So it means today it's obvious there are plenty of stars and plenty of planets. Um, we tend to see life as being special, but maybe in 100 years it will be obvious that life is not special at all. It's just part of the conclusion of the universe. So as a physicist, I do claim this is a topic for physics in a sense, but physics in a global sense, because the problem is very complicated. You need a, to grasp a lot of different aspects. And the most fascinating element of life, as if today, so life is very active on Earth. That's the only place when we see life on the solar system. But life is keep reproducing. We don't create life. We just keep reproducing life. The mechanics has been set up a billion years ago. We have not changed very much in terms of structure. And think about that when you talk, when you see a trees and the same mechanism, same system. 
than on us. But life is not happening creating today. There is no complete creation of life today on Earth. We have not seen it, at least. And the reason for that is because the creation of life, the moment when you move from chemistry to life on Earth, you have to go back to a time when Earth was very different. And that was the moment when life happened on Earth. That is the condition. This is about at that time, the atmosphere was completely different. CO2 dominated, I mean, nitrogen dominated, maybe having a SO2, it's a lot of water, kind of active volcanic activities. So very, very different situation here. And that is the origin of life. And what is fascinating here is we have planets that we have found today which are in similar conditions. We know from observations of this planet that they are in the same state. They're not in the same state because they're young. They are in the same state because they're close to the star. They maintain. It's a bit like some of the satellites of giant planet that they maintain some volcanic activities because of the tides effect between, um, um, between the planet and the, and, the, uh, and the satellite. So it's a bit the same situation. So in a way, the understanding of the inside of the planet, how they connect the inside to the outside, which is the key here about the atmosphere, is something we can do, we can do today. And, and that is, in a way, the revolutions. Um, it's not the fact we, we found planets. It's, it's no, we have a mechanism to explore um, in a data-driven um, build-up phase. It's not about debating about it. It's just fact-based. What could have looked like the origin of life on Earth comparing with other planets? Adding as well the fact that we're exploring Mars and we're going to bring back some sample because Mars in the first billion years is likely to having been the same that, that the Earth. So it's very interesting. And the question about Venus is fascinating because Venus is about the same mass and the size on the Earth. There is no more water right now. Was it because there had never been any water on Venus and all the water was on, on Earth and then life never developed because of lack of water, or we had plenty of water at the beginning and we had plenty of life on Venus. It was a green planet like us. But something happened on the planet. Um, maybe the CO2 recycling didn't work, stopped functioning, and I think in a way, this is the kind of astronomical uh, perspective on the global warming. This is the end story of us if you don't fix the way the society is working right now and, and, and the way we're addressing the amount of CO2 we're putting back into the atmosphere, which is creating this, this enhanced effect of global warming here. So I think we are in a very, very fascinating moment because we are in a position to make progress on possibly one of the most fundamental questions is why it is life on Earth and in kind of a global way. And I think in terms of astrophysics, what is beautiful is what I've seen here. It's the, just the very beginning. I, I used to compare this work that has happened in the last 30 years at the very first moment uh, um, that was happened in a, in a lab in Cambridge when Rutherford was breaking the atoms and demonstrating the, the foundation of the, of the molecules and for the foundations of how that worked, the chemistry with the atoms there. So that was really the very moment here. And, uh, and how, you think about how much the high energy physics has evolved, and we're talking about Higgs, boson Higgs these days. So we are about the same moment. There is 100 years of progress on that. And, and sooner or later, we will be able to make such a picture. I brought this picture. It's very famous. It's a blue dot picture. And that's a picture of our own planet seen from a probe that was, um, at that time, uh, drifting out of the solar system and looking at this Carl Sagan picture. The reason why I want to show that is this was a picture that we could done with the technology of the 60s, which were limited, on a planet, which is our own planet in the solar system. Well, I do think that we will be able to do similar picture, but on other stars, because we're building the equipment and the tool to do that. You don't rule, you don't break the law of physics to do that. You don't need them to go faster than the speed of life. It's just a technology-driven problem. Uh, it's about the right telescopes, the right technology, and we have all this kind of ready. It's just a matter of implementing that in the cheapest way to make it really possible. So it's going to happen, and I could make predictions according to the growth of knowledge and creativity and innovations that we see every day. And it's so difficult to predict what is the next innovation to come 20 years ago. And I just invite you to think about the way we were 20 years ago, 
whether any of you would have predicted um, the cell phone at that time. And uh, maybe Stanley Kubrick was the only one thinking about the iPad in this movie. But aside that, most of the people were not aware at all uh, what you could guess, and we're not. Um, I think it's very realistic that we should be able to do that and possibly making such a picture. And this is just to tell you how it looks like by det detecting a planet where you can find out uh, a structure, an atmospheric structure. This is exactly the structure of the Earth. I'm not claiming that we should be looking for the exact copy of the Earth. I think that would be a mistake. Um, but just to show you that this is possible, that will be possible. There is the stars, the planet are there. It's just about the technology. And we should just get ready to understand that. And that's a fascinating problem to try to understand this and the structure of the atmosphere for the new generations. It, it needs a bit more creativity. It's a complex problem. It needs to connect the dots, the chemistry, the atmospheric chemistry, the earth science, exploration of the planetary system, the technology, space technology as well, everything together. But this is going to happen. So I will leave you with this thought and this feeling that uh, science is really cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.